Welcome everybody. The time is 6.31 p.m. on Wednesday, August 21st. Welcome. I feel like it's been a little while. All right. So for those attending tonight's meeting, you should be aware that the meeting is being audio and video recorded by says um, SPACO. Is that right? In ASRSD? Did I do that correctly, Michelle? If I did not, I <laughs> okay, APAC, just making sure. <laughs> it's being audio and video recorded by APAC and ASRSD. Any audience members who wish to record any part of the meeting must inform the vice chairperson who will announce, um, I'm sorry, who will announce the recording. This is to comply with the Massachusetts wiretap statute. The listings, the listings of matters are those reasonably anticipated by the chair, which may be discussed at the meeting. Not all items listed may in fact be discussed and other items not listed may also be brought up for discussion to the extent permitted by law. Okay, let us do the call, I uh, just did the call order, sorry. Pledge of Allegiance, please. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Michelle, whenever you're ready. Mr. Rodney. Here. Mrs. Bernard. Here. Mr. Quincy. Here. Mrs. Richards. Here. Mr. Rupert. Mr. Here. Okay, so we're going to open up for public comment. Um, first, I'll do online. Do you have anyone online, Michelle? Okay. Do I have anyone in the audience for public comment today? Let me give it 10 seconds. Okay. Uh, so I am going to go to Dr. Renda um, for introduction of the new district administrators. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm excited to introduce to the school committee and to the public uh, the new principal of Page Hilltop Elementary School, Mrs. Bonnie Faulkner. Bonnie comes to us with a wealth of experience in elementary education. She has been a first grade teacher, an instructional coach, an assistant principal, and a principal. Uh, recently, most recently, she's coming to us from Draycott, where she was an elementary principal for the past five years. Six, uh, six years, <laughs> excuse me. And prior to that, um, she was an instructional coach and teacher in Fitchburg Public Schools. Awesome. Good evening. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, when I got, saw the opportunity to come back to AIR, I don't, for those of you who don't know, I was actually an AIR High graduate. <laughs> um, and I feel that AIR High really um, did a great job preparing me for college and getting into the educational um, field. Um, I don't know if any of you also graduated from Air High. Paula Sullivan made sure that I was going to college. She made sure I was going to do it, so I owe a lot to her. Um, she was an incredible mentor for me. And um, I'm so grateful to be able to kind of come full circle and come back and serve the community that I feel like served me really well. So, thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have questions or anything? Yeah. All right. So did you grow up in Air? Or? I didn't. We, uh, my parents still live in Air. My parents live on Sandy Pond. They moved when I was in high school. So I attended Air High. My younger brothers and sisters all went to Page and Hilltop. Of course, there were two different schools then in the junior high. Back home again. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Back home again. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. And my, my parents are thrilled. You know, my mother already called me. Oh, <laughs> you can swing by the house. <laughs> <laughs> my neighbor. It's, my it's neighbor. Been wonderful. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 Awesome. We're neighbors. Right here. <clears throat> Anyone else? Yeah, Jim. It just seems wrong that you have Paula Sullivan because it's Paula was in my class and this is our fiftieth reunion. I know. I actually spoke to her. This through. is all wrong, but <laughs> we're, we're glad you're here. Well, she was a wonderful educator. She was one of one of my yeah. top five people that had an impact on me in education. Yeah. So. And the year this is, and this will not surprise you. The year before she retired, she came into the school committee meeting in May yeah. and assigned a book to every person in the entire building, including the custodial staff, administrators, and school committee. That we all had to read the Hunger Games and discuss later. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't surprise me at all. And, and I still, to, to this day, remember things I've learned in her classroom. I can cite poetry that she made me memorize, <laughs> all kinds of stuff like that. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm really excited, and I want to say that the staff and um, Charlie and Adam and everybody have been so incredibly supportive in getting me transitioned in, and um, I've met teachers, and um, I have a meet the principal night tomorrow night up on the playground for any parents or staff that want to come that haven't met me yet. Um, we had a meet and greet with the kindergarten. It went really, really well. We had a great turnout, so everything's moving smoothly. I won't jinx myself. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. welcome. All right. Okay, I am going to go on to the consent agenda. So, as we can see, the consent agenda has a vote. So, we have the June 26, 2024 regular session meeting minutes for release, a donation of $1,250 from Rollstone Charitable Foundation sponsorship with the Noah Gray football camp to be used towards the Air Shirley football program. Thank you so much. And then we have our warrants, AP warrant 1201, 1202, 1212. Ms. Span, if One, I may. Yes. Um, you, you do not need to read all of the warrants uh, yeah. because they are in print and part of public record. Thank you. So because they're a part of public record, I will not read the rest of the list. Thank you for reminding me. It's been a wonderful vacation. Okay, so. Madam Chair, if yes. I may. Uh, there are a couple of clerical errors on the warrants list. I think uh, cutting, cutting and pasting is great, but I think it led to some errors here. So I just wanna make you aware of them. We'll have a corrected copy for the minutes. Uh, but starting with warrant number 1214, uh, the full amount that is supposed to be listed there is 307.51. Uh, coming down to warrant uh, number 1001, AP warrant 1001. Uh, that is the incorrect amount for that warrant. That warrant was $336,706.23. The next one down is also label, is labeled uh, AP warrant uh, 1012. And that amount is also wrong. It was copied down incorrectly. And the amount for that warrant, warrant number 1012, was $776,288.09. Um, AP warrant 10... There's two 1012s. You may just want to clarify which dated 1012. On there's two, two 1012s, which is an error as well. So that second uh, 1012 dated A2 is incorrect. That's supposed to be, uh, that is labeled AP Warrant 1021, not 1012. Those last two numbers were transposed. And that's it on the errors for that list. It was quite a list, right. but uh, we'll watch the uh, cutting and pasting going forward. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, is that clear enough for the, for the minutes or should we see it kind of redone? They're clear um, for the minutes according to Michelle. Uh, so I'm going to open it up for a discussion. Do we have anything that we need to discuss before voting? Just, yeah. just one minor uh, typo on page three of the minutes for the uh, changes in the uh, update of the wellness policy. The, uh, the second, the actual change that we talked about is the proposed language. It's just a typographical Okay. Anything else? I'm sorry, Jim, I couldn't hear you. Could you repeat that? Um, on page three of mm -hmm. the minutes at the top of the page, we have the current language, and then the next paragraph should read the proposed language. It was just a current proposed language. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All right. So let us take a vote on the consent agenda. All those in favor of the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Hi, Chris. Hi there. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It sounds like it sounds like that was unanimous. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Excellent. So we can move forward to new business. Chris, would you like to take over? Or would you like me to continue? I'm more than happy to have you continue. I'm not sure how good my audio is in the room. I certainly uh, am not able to pick up on many of the social cues in the room. So um, I'm more than happy to have you continue, Erica. Okay. Just want to make sure. 
All right, mm -hmm. so next we will move on to our presentation on the AIR Senior Center project. I'm sorry, and that is um, Dr. Katie, is it Petrosi? am I saying that correct? Okay, and then um, Senior Center Director and Chair of the Committee, Mr. Robert, is it, how do you say it, Ponson? Pondrian. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So you All can right. take it away. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the school committee, Dr. Renda, thank you for having us. I'm Robert Pondrian, the Air Town Manager. And the good news is I'm not making the presentation, so it won't be, it won't be uh, long. But I just wanted to offer a couple of introductory um, remarks. Uh, the Town of Air desperately needs a new senior center and the town has been committed over the last three or four years but really in the last almost year dedicated to um, this project and the biggest challenge for the project is to find a viable site so tonight you're going to hear a presentation uh, that'll give you an update on where we are with the project, and we are narrowing it down to two sites. One site uh, is potentially off of Groton Harvard Road. It would be on school property, hence why we're here. We'll talk a little bit about that procedurally and so forth and questions on that. Uh, the committee has not made a definitive decision yet to the select board on a site. That, we, that will be happening relatively soon. So without further ado, uh, I want to just introduce uh, Dr. Katie Petrasi, who is the director of the AIR Senior Center and Council on Aging and the chair of the building committee. Uh, we're also joined by Mr. Ken Diskin, who is on the building committee, also a member of the AIR Planning Board, and AIR Selectman uh, Chris Tavares. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to Dr. Petrasi. Thank you. And we also have um, Matt on the Zoom from the DPW, if there are any technical uh, link related questions. So thank you again for having us here to give you an update. Um, do you want me to just tell you next slide? Is that? That'd be great. Okay, yeah. awesome. Next I'm, slide. I'm oh, you're doing it. Okay. I'm no, doing next it. Slide. <laughs> so for today's, as, as Robert said, today's um, update is really sort of a little bit about why we need a new senior center and the progress that we've made to date. So next slide. Uh, AIR, just like the bulk of the country, is aging. Uh, over 25% of air residents are over age 60. This is a what they call the graying of America. That trend is expected to continue until it peaks in the year 2060. So this demographic shift is a long-term one. And um, we, we know from a preponderance of research that senior centers are a vital community resource. They help seniors stay in their homes and remain independent and contributing members of our town for a long time through things like fitness classes, low-cost meals, social and intellectual engagement, which helps um, counteract the devastating health effects of isolation, health education in chronic disease self-management, transportation, and access and assistance with the um, ever-lengthening forms that come with um, getting health insurance and social services um, over time. Next slide. So in order to, to be able to provide that kind of the, the breadth of um, services and um, the breadth and the depth of services that are needed, the current senior center just does not, it's not adequate for where we are now, uh, especially given the growth that we're expecting to see. The current senior center is a rented space. It's hard to find around the back side of the Pond Street. Um, senior housing. There's 13 spots in the lot, um, three of which are taken up by housing authority members. There's not enough programming space. What's needed to program for a 60-year-old newly retired older adult is wholly different than for someone in their late 80s or early 90s. There's just not enough programming space. We have two rooms right now. Actually, one of them doesn't even belong to us. There's not enough office space and it's not confidential, so when you wanna have a private conversation with someone, my office walls don't go all the way up to the ceiling. So people who are sitting four feet away from me having lunch can hear the entire conversation. Um, there's not a commercial kitchen, so uh, we're not able to provide low cost, healthy, nutritious meals. We're currently bringing them in uh, and have a catering budget for that. And the whole building is not ADA compliant. Um, 
when someone needs to use a walker or a wheelchair, it often involves a lot of, can you scoot this way for a second? Can you scoot this way for a second? Um, I had to rescue people out of our restroom because they get stuck um, of both genders because they can't circle their, um, their wheelchairs in there. Um, so it's, it's just not adequate to meet our, our current or future needs. Next slide. What we're looking for is a modern senior center, something that is the opposite of all those things I just described. This a, a building that has space for a variety of the exercise, social wellness, and educational programs that today's seniors need. A commercial kitchen for a daily meals program, outdoor space for gardening, walking, socializing, confidential office space, of course, adequate parking and accessibility. Next slide. So, We've been at this for a long time, actually, before I even came to the town of Ayr. The original feasibility study started in 2018, 2019. Uh, it had a lot of town input and ended with a town meeting vote in the fall 2020 meeting to uh, vote down or to table the West Main Street site. Uh, at that time, COVID kind of became the number one thing on people's minds. The project sat for a little bit. And then we started up again a working group in 2022 that looked at um, a lot of different town owned and property, uh, town owned and private properties, and ended with um, this recommendation of a of a community center at Peroni Park. Um, that that effort ended with Parks and Rec backing out of the the Peroni Park site. And so then we decided we need to continue to move forward. The need did not change. So in August of 2023, the select board appointed the Senior Center Site Selection and Building Committee. We've gone through all 54 town-owned properties and narrowed that down to uh, two town-owned parcels. We also did a request for um, proposals for private landowners. We did not receive any responses. That's now the second time we have reached out to private landowners, both on a large scale and on an individual level. So what we've done is narrow it down to two town-owned parcels. Next slide. So they are Bishop Road, and uh, which is essentially where the uh, brush dump is, and then Broughton Harvard Road, where um, Washington Street and Broughton Harvard Road come together. Next slide. So just real quickly, uh, we've had the architect, we hired an architect, we've begun to look at floor plans and site placement. This is um, the current, it's a final, but the current um, version of a Bishop Road site. The building is really um, kind of right on top of what you would call the existing brush dump. Um, you know, lovely adequate parking, um, building, the building is about 14,000 square feet that we've worked on. Uh, next slide. And like any project, there are pros and cons. There is no one perfect site. The advantage of Bishop Road is that it's a flexible lot. It's wide open. It will be easy to stage construction. Um, plenty of room for expansion. There's very little traffic out Bishop Road there. It's close to Park Street and Main Street in terms of the downtown area. And it's adjacent to Oxbow, which presents some opportunities for nature appreciation, um, which is wonderful. The limitations, of course, there are no utilities on site. They would need to be brought in, um, and that, of course, involves outside entities um, like National Grid and their timelines. Uh, it's an isolated location in the sense that you don't just drive by it on your way to anything else. Most people don't, so it, it has um, poor street visibility. There are some designations, the ACEC and the Rare Species Environmental designations. None of those are um, deal breakers. They just involve a little bit of extra paperwork and some public hearings. Uh, we don't think that those are um, going to stop the process. They'll just be um, a process to work through. Uh, mass development, we've, uh, there is a gate there on Bishop Road that closes when there's flooding. We've already had successful um, conversations with mass development about moving that gate out beyond the senior center property. Um, and putting appropriate signage at Park Street and Bishop. So that one is not really a limitation. Uh, and then, obviously, issues of road ownership to work out. So it, plenty of advantages, some limitations. I don't think any of those are, are, are deal breakers. So this sort of brings us to site. Uh, the second option, and the reason that we're here tonight, is Groton Harvard Road. This uh, one represents 
Um, at the top of the screen there is Washington, and the little squares are the private homes along Washington Street. And then the road running vertically is Groton Harvard Road. So that parking lot, just to give you a little bit of reference, that parking lot is sitting right on top of the water catchment basin. I use the right word. Retention the, basin. Retention yeah. basin. Um, and the architect has some plans for managing that. Um, so the building is the, the red square there. Um, and then just to orient you, so the bottom left hand of the screen is where the uh, tennis courts are. Next slide. Again, advantages and limitations to this site as well. It has great visibility from the road and um, people drive by there on the way to the transfer station, I'm gonna say on the way to the hospital, <laughs> um, but um, on their way to Groton and other, other places. Um, it's central to the Washington Street side of town. Um, there is electricity and water, all of the utilities at the road on one side or the other, um, which certainly keeps costs down. The central location, there's the opportunity, depending on where and how it's sited, to have some collaborative use of the practice football field. Um, where it's currently sited right now, the latest iteration, um, it's not gonna be, we had originally talked about whether it was possible to put it right there next to it. Um, it doesn't seem like that's the most advantageous place, so um, it would be downhill from that practice field. Limitations, of course, traffic concerns as people tend to travel fairly quickly along both of those roads. Um, there is the process, part of what we'll talk about today, to create a new parcel and to work with the school um, district to figure that out. Um, it, there's, li there's a limited recreation designation on all of the land there that isn't um, actual school building, but I don't think it's um, a state recreation designation. I think it's local. Um, we're looking into that. And then uh, it involves some amount of stormwater management combination with the school, and then um, the potential uh, of the elementary school building process, which I know is something that's on the radar, but down the road. Um, so. Next slide. So for, again, for the reason that we're here tonight is mostly to talk about what the opportunities are with the Groton Harvard Road site to see the level of interest and support that the school committee has. Um, the next steps would be, obviously as we're here tonight, to attain um, the support of the school committee to further explore and, and so possibly select that site as the site for the new senior center. Um, then if, um, the Senior Center Site Selection and Building Committee, that's the, um, the abbreviation up there, um, would then choose the site. Again, we're looking at two sites, so there is no, um, we haven't chosen one yet. Um, so if we had your support, that would allow us to potentially choose the site. From there, there would need to be a survey to create a legal parcel. Uh, then with that information about what exactly that parcel would look like, then the school committee and the select board would need to vote to declare that piece of the larger 55 acres to be surplus. And then um, once both of those boards did that, then a town meeting vote would be needed to confirm it as surplus and to create the new parcel for the purposes of the senior center. Next slide. So just to give you a little um, preview of what we're what we're thinking the building will look like, it's a two-story structure with 14,000 square feet total. Um, everything that is sort of that reddish brown color is program space. So when you come in at the top of the screen, there's office areas in purple off to the left. There's a cafe, a library, and an activity room off to the right. Um, plenty of restroom, ADA compliant restrooms. The big room in the bottom um, is a multi-purpose room that will seat up to 150 people for lunch, which we expect for our large gatherings. Um, and then uh, it is dividable, not quite in the middle, but you can see a little line there for our 40 to 50 people we expect to have on um, a daily basis for lunch, and then exercise classes happening on the other half. There's a commercial kitchen, plenty of storage, a patio, um, a, a room designed for uh, 
like walkers and wheelchairs and medical equipment, um, loaning, swapping, which is um, something that our current senior, senior center isn't able to accommodate due to the size limitations. Then let's see, next slide. Um, upstairs is a, a partial second floor, it's not the whole footprint. Um, upstairs there is room for cards and games, um, two billiards tables should the committee choose to go that route, extra restrooms, um, two more activity rooms, an exercise, um, like a fitness equipment room, uh, and then a small office for the public health nurse, for a, um, like a spa, like manicure, pedicure, podiatrist, massage, Reiki, um, health insurance, um, consultations, all the things that you'd want to have happen in a smaller, more confidential space. And then, um, you know, we're, we're trying to see if we can get a walking, um, a little walking path around the building, as well as that outdoor patio space so people can enjoy the fresh air as much as they can. Next slide. So, um, again, next steps more broadly um, would be the committee is meeting, the Senior Center Site Selection and Building Committee is meeting on August 28th. We are hoping to select a site then. It's possible we have a little bit more information coming in. We're still waiting for the final cost estimation and um, we have an update to the utility information. So we will be, um, if we're not able to select on August 28th, it would probably be in the middle of September at the latest because we're wanting to, to move the process forward. Um, then the committee would, um, our charter was to investigate the possible places and determine um, where and what a senior center could look like. So then we need to take our recommendation back to the select board for approval. Then we go through the public input um, process for education and, and feedback. And then finally, we would go to town meeting with either a request for funds to build the senior center or a two-part, if it was Grubman Harvard Road, it would be two-part to confirm the surplus and then uh, request the funds to build the senior center. Next slide. Oh, wait, I shouldn't miss the last one. Okay. Um, questions? Can you do something you want to add? I, I just want to thank you guys for having us here tonight. Um, the process that we're in right now is essentially a feasibility study. So we've been fortunate enough to get funds from the town to support this phase of the project. We've got uh, like $360,000 from some grants and from ARPA funds and other things. That gave us the ability to go out with an RFP to architectural firms to help us in the design of the building and in helping us site the building on the, on the lot and whatever lot we could find. So the long and short of it is that we've committed to, to spending, you know, some architectural funds, we've committed to some engineering, we were able to do testing. Fortunately, we've got permission to dig some holes um, and we determined that basically both sites at this point in time are approximately equal. So we're not exactly sure how the, the committee is going to vote. Um, a big determinant is going to be the cost of utilities at getting utilities to the brush dump. This is a huge advantage here to have utilities available, all utilities, sewer, water, and so forth. Um, we've got a lot of cooperation from the Department of Public Works in the process. They've been a partner with us right along the process. Um, it's starting from the, the fact that we, as, uh, as uh, Katie indicated, we actually looked at all 54 town-owned pieces of property from the smallest to the biggest, and that's how we ended up at these two locations. By carefully inspecting each one and looking at every criteria that you can imagine from wetlands to you know, easements, you name it, topography, ledge, the, the whole nine yards. Um, we actually didn't, when we look, came to, to look at the, the property that was controlled by the school, we were leaning more towards up the hill from where we ended up, near closer to the, uh, the practice field. But in essence, when we looked at that and tried to put the parking and the other um, requirements, it's a parking for about 100 cars is what the engineers are, are telling us we need to support this building. And it just doesn't fit between Harvard, Rotten Harvard Road and the field, and that it would, it would have been too narrow. Going down the hill to the spot that we showed you, the triangular spot, um, the, really only, the real only, only obstacle down there was, again, we were, weren't sure if it was going to be ledgy or some issue with the soils and other things, because it's pretty ledgy around the site, and the testing did not show that. The testing actually showed the material was good, fascinating to all of us. So, and when we walked down that, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sure most of you haven't walked down that spot, but when you get down there, it's, it's interesting that it's 
little bit flatter than your eye, tricks your eye. It's a little flatter than you think. The grade is not as severe as it appears from the road. So it's certainly an, access, an accessible and acceptable location. Um, initially, when we looked at it, the architect was talking about having one entrance. They, they believe in, the, situ, in the, the design that you need one entrance to enter to a senior center parking lot and one entrance one exit area for the, the, just because of the way seniors negotiate their parking and turning and whatnot. And it looked as though we were going to use one entrance on the side of the street on the Groton Avenue Road and an exit on the other side in Washington. But after relocating and working on it, it looks like we can have both approaches as we showed. Maybe we should go back to that slide, but from Washington Street. So there's, in, in the time that we've spent on this, which is over a year, we have basically looked at all town property. We have hired an architect to help us. The architect that won the bid, fortunately, is also the gentleman who has built 30 senior centers in the state of Massachusetts. He's a prominent speaker on the topic of senior centers, and he happened to have the best price. So we were fortunate enough to get a, a qualified uh, assistant in the process, the architect, and he also has brought us a piece of the puzzle beyond just the architecture where he is familiar with the site work requirements, civil engineering requirements, uh, you know, the, all of the whole process. So his thought process in looking at how we land the, the property, uh, land the site on the project on the property is more than just the building and the inside of the building. We're looking at the entire operation as how we approach the building and how to get to the building. So we're here tonight to tell you that we hope you'll consider this to be a positive uh, thought. And it's in a location that doesn't appear to be a part of what would be a school expansion because of its location. Um, we're just looking for positive support from the, your school, the school committee to tell us that we could go forward and potentially break a lot off in that location. And that's some of the work we've been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have anything? Yeah, Kevin? Yeah, so uh, um, we talked earlier, I know, and I mentioned some of the concerns that I would have about using the limited space there. So can you tell me from um, when we met with you earlier, has this location changed since then? Or like, yes. where would the existing current practice football field be on this chart? Do we know? So, yeah, it's, it's yeah, right where the cursor is there. Um, so when we had initially talked, we thought it would be, so those two lines are contour. Sure. Lines, yeah. So. Um, so we originally were looking at this. We just thought this might be too steep and whatnot. It kind of tricked us. We were looking at, here's the practice field here. We were looking at putting it linear across parallel to the Groton Hobbit Road this way. Um, and as it turned out, that was too narrow, as I mentioned. We could not get the parking. They, they want the parking in front of the building rather than to the side of the building to minimize the distance and site visibility for seniors coming in and out of the lot. So the, the building may end up turning one way or the other in relation to this lot. So this is showing us that it will fit in this triangle, basically. So it was up here before, uh, kind of starting maybe at this point, going beyond the field over here where there's an existing, almost like, it's not a gravel road, but there's a gated entrance to the field. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of, that would have been the middle of the first thought was where that gated uh, okay. railway was. So let's move down. I think this is in the same location, though, as what we looked at mm -hmm. um, when we met at downtown. Because yeah, this is look really the same spot. So I guess we talked about, so at that time, just so everybody else, the, the concern I voiced was if you go back and you look at um, the original field proposal that we had, um, it wasn't just considering where the existing practice football field is which as it, I think, is inadequate, the football coaches would tell you, um, as far as size, it's not a regulation football field. But the other thing that we had at that time is um, to get additional practice fields, we were, were going to move the current softball field down to next to the, the practice football we're field. Um, and that allowed for additional practice um, space because and, you know, if, if you think about expansion in 10 years, 15 years, whatever that is, uh, I definitely would be concerned that, you know, at some point we're talking about adding lacrosse, we're talking about adding field hockey, we have all these other sports, 
and we just have such limited space, I think there's a real possibility that at some point you're going to want the option of having additional field space down at that location. Um, I don't know if we were talking about trying to get the original plans so that we could see what that design was. Not that it's going to be the exact same, but it would give you an idea of at one point what we were looking to do with that space. So I, I waded through those plans, and and again to your, to your point, it could change wholly. It appeared like the shift came this way with the practice field, and then the um, the sort of what do you call that the fan out of the outfield of the softball field went all the way up to where those couple of um, contour lines come together there, where that mm -hmm. steep drop off is there. I thought it ended there. I think obviously that would be um, you on, on your side, but I, when I looked at it after our meeting, that's where it ended. Just because they ended there, we saw that a study that was done. Did that study include the location you were talking about, the test holes and whatnot of that study? The, the one I'm sorry. The study that we, we got a copy of that was showing a lot of test holes that were done for potential future expansion. Well, I'm not referring to the test holes. So there was, there was um, early on one of the field designs, and, and I don't know if it was an official architectural design, but there, there was a proposal that showed um, where a softball field would be moved down there and where, and at that time, there, I think they were going to move the existing football a little bit to the left to make room for the softball, mm -hmm. and then they were going to look to try to expand that to make it more of a feasible, actual, you know, practice field for football. Um, and you see left, you mean towards the school or away? From towards the school, yeah. I believe. But the, we should have a, a, that drawing. I, I believe someplace. we shared. We did share those. Right. Did, did, did you I shared the uh, testing right, holes. Right wall, okay. Right in this area. Here. Not the Where, original they, field. Basically, if you went out there, when they did this field, I, they I pushed could probably the find stuff right over this hill. Okay. And left it right there. So there's a very big, steep slope at this point. Um, so that, interestingly enough, this is below that slope on a, you know, where it flattens out a little more. Um, but that appears, in fact, they're still putting it there today. Grass clippings, whatever you guys are doing, mm -hmm. is going down this way. Um, downhill. So this is a quite a great change that would make it a little complicated to get there, but can be done. Versus the distance it's in here, which you could cut back, you know, make a, put a retaining wall or something. But this is a thought. Yeah, Jim. This is um nearly similar discussion to what we just had in Shirley because there was a uh, private venture that was going to put in. Uh, senior housing next to where the current housing is on Devon's there mm -hmm. <coughs> actually came to a town meeting vote and was defeated. And although it wasn't on school committee property, the discussion immediately surrounded uh, access and possible expansion in the future and really limiting what our our options would be. And that's what I spoke and, and I, I was very clear that I'm not speaking for the school committee. I'm on the school committee and this I think would be a concern uh, and here, I, I know about the area that you're talking about here, you know, but I think for us to make a, de a determination, and I mean, I'm all in favor of the new senior center because I are one, so <laughs> I know how neat it is, and I've done a ton of elder care in the last five years. Um, but I think for us to really make a decision, you, you'd need to flag the property for us so we could go out there and see exactly where it is. I, I wouldn't spend a lot of time digging up you know, field plants and stuff from five or six years ago, that sort of stuff. I think if you flag, um, you know, hey, here's a building, there's a parking lot, this is, you know, we'll get a pretty good idea from what you have here, exactly what we'd be looking at to see down the road whether that would be an issue or not. My gut feel is like, probably not, you know, but I don't really know, and until it's flagged and we get to walk it, it would be diff very difficult for me to set go. And of course, if you end up on Bishop Road, then the, the point is moved anyway. Right. But I, I would really want to walk up the property before I, I call the shot. Yeah. Uh, Joyce? Um, so questions come to mind, uh, such as, how many acres is this that we're talking about? What is this, what does this parameter look like? And I'm looking at the number of, I'm assuming that those little slicey lines are parking. Mm -hmm. And are you putting the same 
uh, building on Bishop Road as you're proposing here, or would that be a different design? So the architect has approved either one yes. at this point? We've approved either one. Those are, that totals 100 parking spots um, on either site, which is what the architect is recommending. And the same footprint for the building? Yes, same footprint okay. for the building. Um, and so then, how many acres, so if, we, if we give that to a size thing, it's probably, it's less than two and a half acres. Yeah, I'm just curious because yeah. it's kind of think in that direction. The objective was an acre and a half to two and a half. So I'm giving you the high end. We we'll probably use two and a half acres to that whole project. And I have to admit that I haven't gotten the new glasses, so I can't see very well. Um, so the entrance and the, and the exit are both on Washington Street where yes. people are flying down from that hill. Mm -hmm. And then we have bus transportation and teenagers driving. That seems like one of the issues that happen. we started with from day one is the fact that we are trying to make an effort to save a million dollars in land acquisition. So that was our goal first as a senior center site selection committee. Uh, and so we were limited as to what we can do. Each right. site's going to have issues. Uh, no, I mean I'm just you know I'm just seeing this for the first time, and I think I kind of agree with whoever said flagging it and walking down and yeah, seeing what it. our proximity is That's to that property would be a good idea. The other thing is that if we have um, the uh, practice field there, which means we're going to have students there, and then what kind of security do we, ha do we have to put forward to make sure that the parcels are separated? So Two, two thoughts on that one. One is that there's a pretty significant grade change from the where the, the existing practice field is mm -hmm. down, what is it, 20, can't walk. 20 or so feet. Um, I don't think you're going to have any seniors coming. So you're not moving any land there. You're not moving any, any field. It's, it's totally put the building down and nothing else. Well, we, we wouldn't be touching the, the practice. No, no, but I mean, when you say there's a grade, is it going to be a deeper grade? Or are we going to have to flatten oh, no, I say the naturally a certain occurring. amount of the area natural. there to put the building and the parking in? The naturally occurring grade is is steep that's there, is what I'm saying. OK. Um, and then I had spoken with, um, with um, the police chief way back when we started looking at this to see um, what the requirements were for security and, and he had deferred and said well it's really up to the school and then um, you know we had inquired further and it was as long as they're not using the same entrances or exits um, that it didn't seem to be a security risk it's not on it would be its own legal parcel at that point if that makes sense are you concerned with security well, to the school or to the senior center you could go both Either ways way. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> okay. I, I'm in that age group, so you can go both ways. Um, you know, and it's it's something that always comes up. Yeah. And if we don't con we don't want to consider it later, I think we want to bring these questions up now. I'm not attacking you. Yeah. It's just that you know, um, and we were very adamant that in and surely that we not give up a fairly small piece of parcel of land that's next to the middle school for the expansion that we're going to have in the future. And, you know, if you've got a senior center there and we're stuck on this site for high school, now if we need to expand, where do we go? This is a real, real tight um, campus. And Kevin knows more than anybody else, even getting the fields project done and everything, how tight everything is. There is no budge. So, um, where are the tennis courts in relationship to that? The I mean, nothing's on there. Yeah, nothing uh, other than yeah, your yeah, site's on the, there, right? Can you see where the cursor's right. The bottom left corner here. Right there. Oh, okay. Yeah. So how many feet is that? How many? Because we had the construction guys there on that little side road when we built this school. How many feet from the tennis courts to the senior center? To the parking lot? Is that a side parking? I assume that back parking is for staff. That back or something. parking is actually so the the this drawing that that red building needs to hug up next to it because that's actually the handy the accessible parking there. Um, it actually needs to hug up right next to the building. So it needs to be rotated, or it, the building is just going to rotate just a smidge. 
Um, I, I missed that question. What was the question again? No, just I'm just trying to figure out. Um, I've been over on that land quite a bit when we were doing all the construction stuff. So um, I'm just trying to picture exactly where that is. It didn't seem like that there was a lot of distance there. So you, you, you haven't been down with that pocket lot as a wish though. Unless you walked all the way down to the detention base and that with a triangle, the, the two roads meet. That's how far down that is. Yeah, yeah okay. So the, the current, that parking lot as pictured here is on there. top of the detention basin. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, I mean, we'll move forward. I, it yeah. sounds like we'll just, you can flag and we can walk and get a, a, a good visual. And I, I don't see it as a big problem. Yeah. Um, I like having the seniors down close to the school because then we can drag them up for a concert is all sorts of stuff. But it would, from a public hearing standpoint, if you take something back, I'm looking at your parking here, and my experience is like seniors in reverse, bad. Yes. Like bad, 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 bad. That's where stuff's gonna happen. So if, when you're looking with your designer, if you need more land to spray so so people can drive into a parking spot and drive forward to get out of there, really concentrate on that because outside of the vehicle stuff people are walking around nobody's paying attention and it's it's yeah. a mess so i would that's of all the design stuff that's the only thing i see that's a problem and so if you need a little bit if we walk it and it's not going to cause us any trouble you might have to expand it to give yourself a, a parking situation where you don't have to use reverse right that's um one of the many things i um like about catlin architecture the company that we chose they um, design almost exclusively senior centers so the parking spots are a foot wider instead of the standard eight and a half feet they're nine and a half feet wide and then they have that buffer in between each spot and that's he designs one-way traffic separate and you see there's um, on the left hand side and the right hand side there's separate entrance and exit so people aren't passing by each other in like a two-lane road uh, it's a good point though because you want to make sure you have enough space for, for all of that. So it sounds like, it, are there any other questions that I want to take up more of your time? Yeah, um, my only kind of concern, just to echo on the others, would be um, the elementary school and when that upgrade, new build, whatever happens with that, I don't know where that was being considered. So that might be more of like a Dr. Render question, but that would be probably my biggest concern would be if that was a potential location, then I think we'd really need to discuss this before, kind of. So that would be the, um, the building authority would essentially make that decision. So we, w we would have to have a feasibility study. They would come out and test the land. Um, and they would essentially have the same process. They would come up with suitable sites, and then there would be some probably be some options. Okay. One of them possibly being a, right okay. where the existing PHL yeah. top is. Okay. Chris, do you have anything? My question comment was going to uh, be, and sorry, I'm trying to follow. It was going to be similar to the last one was just, I know we have talked about an elementary school um, and I'm not going to say renovation, but like a new elementary school. Um, and I don't know what the plans are thinking would be for that, but I would be hesitant to limit our options. Um, so that would be my only sort of comment, which I think built on the last one. I, Just to give you an idea of the scope of the scale of that red building is shown, it's a 14,000 square foot building, but the first floor is somewhere in the vicinity of eight to 9,000, the second floor in the vicinity of you know, four to 5,000. So that footprint that you're looking at up there, that building is only showing a footprint of it's less than 10,000 square feet, that, that box, that red box. So that's pretty small uh, uh, compared to a, a school library. library. Yeah. Um, okay. About the size of this room. About the size, yeah. If it was two floors. Yeah. That'd be yeah. Uh, so I guess um, the only thing I guess I would chime in with is I hated geometry. Sorry, Mr. Cleary. I hated geometry except for when it came to doing box braids. Um, so I am struggling with this. <laughs> I, I really am, and I think you guys did an excellent job. I think it's just more more me and my deficit in how I'm interpreting this. But I, I think, I guess I echo Jim in that, like having the flags there to like visually see it would be much more helpful. And again, like I told you all before, absolutely 100% agree. 
um, with the project and how it's done. I think I just need to be able to visually see it, um, you know, for myself uh, before we sign off. So I do know on that other slide though you had um, August 28th, and correct me, I'm probably gonna use the wrong terminology, so whoever knows it, please tell, please tell me. And um, when we had the uh, presentation in Shirley, remember they had, it was it aerial shots of it? Like it had the tree, you might already have it. If you do, if you could send it, um, I guess it would technically be to Michelle, like so we could, or, or Adam, so that we could see it. I think that's what I, I need to see in order to understand scale, because I have a feeling that I might be imagining a larger scale than what you guys are actually right. saying. Yeah. I think that might be the problem. Would but it um yes to have it be to show more of the whole school property so that right. you can see it yes. scale with the existing yes. so building. Yeah. Yeah. Highlight this line right here. Okay. Because they show you all the land and south of that on north of that line. Okay. Rather than trying to pick this around. Yes. We we'll just put a line we'll put a line basically what we would recommend as the outside of the lot a new lot. Yeah, that, everything to that side would be right. It's just my my know my context and then is we'll off. Give you an aerial view with that highlight. Yes, that would be great. And then I, I think you know it'll be easier to provide a response because I know that you guys have been working hard on this, and we absolutely want to give you an answer. I just feel that from what I'm hearing, or at least for myself, um, I'm struggling with context to the land, um, so that that way we can give you a definitive answer. And recognizing that again, I know that you have the August 28th or mid-September, um, so that we can give you an answer and be timely. I don't know if anybody else had anything else that they... J could you clarify that the August 28th, or is that um, when your committee is going to vote on uh, selecting a site? So that was, that was our hope. Yeah. Because um, we have been collecting all the uh, rest of the information that we need. Um, we are expecting the cost estimates to come in from the architect for that meeting. Obviously, if this is not resolved, you know, if the school committee hasn't had time and would like to see it flagged, we'd be happy to do that first. Before. Our, our next meeting is the 18th, September 18th, and I know you okay. said mid-September. Would that be prior to the mid-September meeting for your committee? I, I think we could work the next meeting We're around. Yeah. Okay, because um, I, I just wanted to be mindful of, of time and, and coordination because maybe, um, and again, Chris and um, Adam set the agenda, but maybe if we can, um, ha as long as we have the materials before the next meeting, then that way we'd be able to come prepared so that we'd be able to answer that. That is just a suggestion, <laughs> but I, I figure maybe that'll be helpful. Yes, George? Madam Chair, since I think this is yeah. really the first we've heard of this, and um, another question I might have, is there any difference in cost between the Bishop Road site and the Groton Harvard Road that you have? At the moment. That you're leaning, are, yes. but utilities, utilities can be um, brought in, or you're right next to Devon's utilities when you're over there, which might be a real uh, positive thing, having Devon's power going into there since they stayed on during the blackout since the ice storm um, and something like that. A cost of that is not a continuing cost, it's a one-time cost. So uh, does that make one more favorable than the other? So the utilities cost is we have a preliminary and then we're getting a revised um, utilities estimate. I think that is probably the different, the main source of the difference mm -hmm. potentially um, between between the two. Um, it is the same building, the same parking are able to be accommodated on both sites. An excellent question. Um, at the moment, the estimate is, could be from a million and a quarter to a million and a half more for utilities on the brush dump site, since we have to bring everything down the road and then to the tune of 1,500 to 2,000 linear feet of utilities. Because there's no utilities there now at all? There's right. nothing there now. That was the first thing I discovered when I was working on it. Okay. Fascinating. It's everything is at that triangle at the end, which goes right to the airport. Everything on that main road that's right along the river oh, okay. comes from the other side of Devon's right straight to the airport, and nothing comes down McPherson. Not even a street light. Nothing. You said McPherson. What's? McPherson Bishop. Oh. Starts as McPherson, turns into Bishop. You know, it's all one road, basically. 
Right now, looking at our schedule, we only we're just scheduled for one meeting in September. Maybe you can work with the superintendent's office and with the chair to set up something before that, so we can walk the property with right. you. So yeah. by the, when we come to the meeting, that will go. already be done and we'll just right. eliminate a lot of questions. Sure. Yeah. yeah thank you. Jen. I mean, the thing is, we can't create more land here, <clears throat> and that I think is the basic consideration. Okay. This town is growing. This area is growing, Shirley is growing, and we are a regional. And um, they're putting in more and more and more houses every minute. This is a growing area. And to limit our future for the kids, it becomes a deep thought. Okay, so um, I, I know you're already coordinating with Adam and Michelle. So, so we'll do that, but we just want to be mindful of the time and the plans that you have for your, for your committee as well. So we appreciate this, and then we'll look forward for the other, the other um, items that we have and walking um, so that we can um, assist you all uh, for your endeavor since 2018. Is there anything else you want to let us know? I don't want to cut you off. No, no, I just want to say thank you so much for your time Oops. and for putting it out. And if you have any questions in the meantime, please feel free to email me or anyone on the committee or uh, Mr. Palmer. Absolutely. Thank you. 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 Have fun. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to move on to the approval of the 2024-2025 school year student oh. handbook, Mr. Kaliri. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, it's an annual tradition <laughs> to come in with the uh, student parent guardian handbook. Uh, so we've tried for new members, we've tried each year to come back with a memorandum to summarize the changes because the handbook tends to be lengthy uh, since there are a lot of pieces in there and a lot of the law changes that take place we have to update periodically. Uh, we also discovered that we have several different handbooks for each of our different schools. So we've kind of lumped them all together uh, to create one big old packet so that all the information is in one place, which makes it easier and sometimes overwhelming. Um, so I tried to summarize the changes that take place in the memo. That way you don't have to read through all of the changes that are in the handbook since you've approved the handbook each year that we're here. So really you're just kind of approving changes that we've made. Um, so just a brief summary, the yearly changes that we include in there include changing calendar dates, school year references, names and the rosters, phone extensions. Um, specifically, we made changes to the start times for the middle school and the high school. So those schedules for middle school and high school are referenced in there as well as the start times. Meal pricing, the continued free piece can, is uh, for school lunches and breakfast is still there. Uh, changes to the handbook signature page, basic edits for grammar and titles and headings and so on. Those are yearly changes that we, that we make. Um, specific content that exists in there uh, with changes to some of the administrative roles. There are point of contact changes for 504 contact, for homelessness, the McKinney-Vento Act, Title IX, and for Title VI. Those are reflected in page 12. You'll notice in the handbook, if you saw the digital version or if you had a color printout, you will have seen ones that had, were highlighted in green. Those are changes that I'm, intent, I'm recommending that we make. Uh, and those are what the new changes are going to be. The things that are in red, areas that are highlighted in red, are areas that we are recommending to remove. Um, and those, some of those are being replaced, some other just changes. Um, we updated the wording on page 18 about excessive absenteeism, or more importantly, chronic absenteeism, to make sure that we clarified what the law says uh, and define what the consequences are for that. So that's reflected on page 18. We added uh, specifics about the video surveillance systems that are on the buses. That was on page 29, because that information um, was not present in the handbook. We had information in the handbook about video surveillance, but we didn't specify that they were present on the buses, so we need to make that clear. Mm -hmm. uh, we added the uh, preschool start times and end times and drop-off times. Those were changed last year. That came to the school committee a couple of times, so we reflected those changes. Uh, in addition, school committee had made recommendations relative to athletic fees. Those changes are represented uh, in the handbook in two places, one in the main place for the high school, but also in the athletics handbook, because all these handbooks live separately for folks that, you know, if you're participating in an extended day, for example, you would get a copy of the extended day handbook. You also have access to the whole thing, but you may get a copy of the extended day. 
Uh, there were some conduct updates that were made in the high school section, specifically to remove any references to in-school suspension. Uh, and I had mentioned before, we added extended day enrichment program addendum, because that was a separate piece that was existed before, but since it's subsumed under the district, we wanted to make sure it was included in the handbook. So, I'm happy to take any questions on any of the changes or anything else is fair game in the handbook. Um, in the absence of any questions, what I would propose uh, is that the school committee vote to approve the handbook for release um, with the changes that are identified and are highlighted in the handbook. Uh, at that point, I will then go and take care of the translation process for Spanish and Portuguese and then we'll get it published to the website and make it accessible and power school so that parents can both see it and sign off on it to meet the legal requirements. <coughs> Yes, Joyce. Um, are there any variations in middle school appendix B that are different than the high school ones? When you have middle school handbook, is that the same as the high school handbook? It just says middle school one? They're not the same. So what's the major? The, it's basically the handbook describes a lot of the operational procedures that exist in each of the schools. Mm -hmm. So. The simple example is the schedule in the middle school is different from the schedule of the yeah, high school. Right, right. High school has credit Start bearing. Time. High school has credit bearing courses, and attendance impacts your credits. And there's graduation requirements that okay. are incorporated that. Yeah. So that's in the high school handbook. That does not exist in the middle school handbook. Okay. So, that's so that's just a simple example. That's it. Okay. Right. Anything else, Jim? Sorry. Did the update that we made to the wellness policy make it into the handbook on the no food party thing? I don't know if it's referenced in the handbook, but I will make certain to double check that. Yeah. So I don't think that we put, we try to avoid putting entire policies oh, and right. whole cloth yeah. Yeah. in the handbook. Oh, we make yeah. reference to the handbook saying these policies are available on the school committee site. Here's a link to the, right. mm -hmm. I will, I assure you that I will double check that. We did drive home that point at the administration retreat. Okay. And there will be communication coming out of my office, the right. superintendent's office, to all parents right. the first week of school. Right. Um, it is, uh, we, we are the, a bit of the fun police, but we just need to change how we celebrate uh, certain things right. in the schools. Um, and, and that's fine. We've, many places have been doing it for a while, so we, we're on top of that. Yeah, I just want to make sure you get one more, one more round in your magazine so you can sit here like it is in the handbook yeah it's one that, that, that's a good suggestion we do have wellness pieces that are in there but they're more relative to like nurse and health services yeah, yeah. but i will I'll, I'll double check and find a way to link it in to make sure it's in there you're you uh, maybe not the whole thing but maybe just, no, the just a reference yeah yep. no outside food chris did you just to yeah jump in off that um in terms of the update to that, so I'm assuming there have been security cameras on the buses prior to this being in the handbook. Um, and I think our policy in uh, section E of our handbook, we do reference um, video recordings, how those are maintained. Um, they're specific to school. I don't know if it's worth us acknowledging um, the buses because I believe we are still custodians of those records in some way. Um, so I, they are part of a student, if they are used at all, they're part of a student's record. They're protected, um, I think. And so I don't know if it's worth us checking with mask um, in terms of the policy. So not a question for the handbook, but just a comment for the school committee in terms of policy in section E, we may want to think about how we, reference um it could be helpful to understand um what these procedures are in terms of how they are storing um sure. videos of students yeah, protected information mm -hmm. okay that makes sense chris so those recordings from the buses are retained by the bus company to access uh, bus recordings we would have to call d yes right so then they are secure, they're responsible for securing them. Yes, but my question would be just for example, um, when you're coming to privacy practices, I know that we have in my uh, industry, right? So in my, in my industry, 
our hospital, even though we use a third party contractor on the hook, if there's a privacy violation by that third party. So I think that might be kind of what Chris is getting at is just making sure that we know for ourselves what's our responsibility and um, the policy process centering around that, even though we don't own the cameras, if there's any kind of privacy or storage or even understanding how D has it so that we're not kind of left hanging there or as a risk. Um, but I asked well, ask, yes. We need to reach out to our general counsel about archiving um, social media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we will add. Okay. Um, Perfect. The, the the bus video to that. Okay. Yes, Joyce. And how far, how long are those records retained for? That would be the other question: is the retention, mm -hmm. the retention. Right. Typically, if it's, it depends on how it's. Um, this much I do know is it depends on the what type of record it's considered mm -hmm. and then there's a retention around that so i guess we would just need to find that out from general counsel a and, and i will so i, I don't yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that i can tell you that a student record yeah, a cumulative folder we we have to keep or a test um, we have to keep for seven years um, with this it, it could be different i can get you that answer that that would be yeah. that's a really tricky question yeah and opens us up a lot to maybe some severe problems. Okay. Uh, sounds like that is it. Chris, did you have anything else? Nope. That was it. And again, nothing for the handbook. I'm, I'm here for all the changes. I appreciate the summary. Awesome. I am as well. Yes, Joyce? Madam Chair, I'd make a motion that we approve the 2024-2025 school year student handbook as presented by Mr. Charlie Cleary tonight. Second. Okay, all those in favor. Do we have to do a roll call vote? Or we can do, we do need to do, okay. Could we do a roll call vote, Michelle? Right. <laughs> That's a good summer. <laughs> Mr. Bresnia? Aye. Mr. Bernard? Aye. Mr. Quincy? Here. Mrs. Richards? Aye. Mr. Rupert? Aye. Aye. All right. So we are in favor. Mr. Cleary, go Thank ahead you. and do what you do. Thank you very much. Appreciate the help. And if you want to review it, make sure it's pure you can. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so next is the superintendent's report, Dr. Renda. Thank you. So we're already at that time, the first day of school. We welcome back our grades 1 through 12 students on Wednesday, August 28th. Our kindergarten friends will join us for their first day, Tuesday, September 3rd. And our preschool students will join us Monday, September 9th. There are some start time changes that we want to remind everybody about. Our middle school start time this year is now 745 and end time is 215. Their 90 minute early release will be 1245 and their half day will be 1115. And for the high school, the start time is 7.55, the end time 2.25, the 90 minute early release 12.55, and the half day at 11.25. And if you remember, we, we made a change um, in that start time because some issues with the times buses were able to get to the high school um, at the end of the day. Uh, we had new, the beginning of new uh, teacher orientation uh, this morning at the library in the middle school. Um, that will continue tomorrow. We also had high school student orientation today here at the high school from 9 to 11. Um, we will welcome back staff uh, this Monday, August 26th. There's a bit of a change uh, this year. We are not holding a convocation this year. We had a lot of feedback um, from our um, teaching staff and paraprofessional staff that they needed more time in their classroom. Um, so we're trying to listen and be responsive and give them uh, that time. Uh, so everyone will start in their own building. Uh, there will be a, a brief uh, virtual um, union meetings uh, in, uh, Monday morning, but the, the, the teachers will have um, at least two hours more, um, probably more than that in their classrooms this year. We also had our administrative uh, retreat uh, last year. The, the, the theme of that was really to reflect what we've done, uh, figure out how to refine that, and then to streamline some of our uh, procedures and, and protocols. Um, it seemed to be well received. Um, we, we had to pivot many of the things we were trying to do at retreat because of um, uh, COVID, traffic accidents, and uh, scheduling conflicts, but um, um, everybody showed up, uh, worked hard, and they're all ready to go. Uh, for the year. 
Uh, we want to thank our custodial staff who has worked tremendously hard this summer to get everything ready for the year. Um, the buildings are looking great. They're almost done. We still have some time, uh, about four more days to, to get it just right for kids. Uh, Bob and his custodians, as always, deserve a thank you. Uh, we appreciate their hard work. Uh, and next on the, the superintendent's report, I took the liberty of drafting a jumping off point of a, of a draft uh, cell phone policy. We did get in touch with Concord Public Schools and um, they would be happy to meet and talk with us, um, but I believe I had shared this at the last school committee meeting. Um, they were all away on vacation and, and kind of recovering from the school year, so they would ask for us to reach back out um, after the start of school to schedule that. Uh, the policy that you're, that you're seeing is really a version of Concord's and, and uh, Lowell's uh, policies. Um, we can certainly read through it, um, but really our next steps are to get some input. Um, talk to parents, teachers, uh, administrators, and school committee. Gather that input, refine uh, this jumping off point, um, get it to the point where we believe this is a policy that we want to implement, and then create an implementation plan sometime after uh, winter break. Um, if you've been following this at all in the news, there, is, there are articles about the benefits of limiting cell phone use in schools mm -hmm. coming out of uh, uh, every, really every news agency. Many schools are moving towards this. There's a push from DESE um, to do something statewide. Uh, so we're, I think we're probably just a, a tad ahead of, of the wave um, that is coming. Um, one of the things that we had looked into is some of these pouches and the the name of those pouches again I, yonder the yonder pouches they look great to start but if you if you dig deep into it our kids are going to hack those pouches and get those unlocked in about 15 seconds mm -hmm. um, there's videos on youtube and other social media sites that show you how to do it it's not very complicated i believe i could probably figure it out um, <coughs> on my own but there, there's there's other uh, there's other options that we can have. There's there's cases with individual slots that can lock and has a handle. It almost looks like a cell phone storage briefcase. So if there was a fire alarm or an emergency, a, a, a teacher could really walk out with them, keeping them safe um, mm -hmm. in out of harm's way. So uh, really, I, in my opinion, that the the bulk of this work because there are so many policies out there that we can borrow from um, is is to communicate this out to families about how this is going to happen and, and why. Um, but I'm happy to go through the, the draft policy if you'd like, but again, um, it's really just a jumping off point to gather some input and suggestions, um, and, uh, and uh, if there are any questions about the start of that, I'm happy to answer. I don't have any right now. I think uh, between reading through this, I think with the different perspective as a parent, um, will be more beneficial to me and then hearing from our community um, is probably going to be the smartest way to approach this because everybody's perspective is going to be a little bit different at least for myself I'm only speaking for myself um, when I say that but I appreciate the work that has been done um, for this the, the real work with this is when we implement and right. um, following through and being consistent with it because there are absolutely going to be students who tests us from day one. Mm -hmm. And whatever we decide of those protocols are, are going to be, as long as we stay uh, true to what they are and follow through with that. If, and if that means a parent coming to pick up the phone after a certain number of violations, um, we have to hold the student and the parents to that. So the school community support uh, with that is going to be uh, very important. Um, and then the, the, as we would like to say, winning the grind um, when, when they're trying to grind you down to get you to change your expectations, if we can keep to the expectation and, and to the policy, eventually we will have less students looking to circumvent what the policy is. And really when you read the articles in, in the research, students tend to appreciate it once they kind of understand that they aren't going to have their phones. Anxiety levels go down, participation goes up, attendance goes up. Um, it's there. It, it seems like this is, is kind of a no-brainer mm -hmm. in, in a direction to go to help the, the kids and the teachers um, in the schools. So we're, we're happy to be moving in this direction. Yeah, so just um, 
it would be great to see kind of when you have what the plan looks like for input, community outreach, parent input. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it just emailed and you know whatever if we can sure. review that or just the next meeting. Uh, I don't know what your timeline is. But we did have um, we did present a, a, an implementation. I believe it was an implementation plan. At, um, one of the last meetings last year. Yeah. What we'll do is we'll, we'll send that out in an email to all of you um, and we will revise that because it's going to certainly need to be revised since then and we can present that at the next meeting. Okay. Perfect. And if there's... I mean, I, I think when I spoke to the last one, I said I'm already biased yeah. strongly, right? So, so as I read through it, I understand that I think it will help uh, the classroom teaches out immensely, especially ones who have trouble controlling the class to begin with. So doing this, you know, district-wide or across the school is an excellent thing. I still, from a, a social aspect and an interpersonal aspect, I, you know, the use in the hallways and the use during cafeteria, I would rather have them interacting with each other in a face-to-face -face basis. It's a much tougher environment to control but that's just my initial interpretation. Of yeah, and this, um, just to be clear, 100% uh, um, draft, I, I just thought having something to jump off of mm -hmm. uh, is, was much easier to do. Um, and there's a lot of uh, benefits to, to keeping them for the day. The, the management of it would be much easier. You're collecting them once, you're giving them back once. Mm -hmm. um, so we can certainly take that feedback and, and, okay. and whatever the final uh, version of that policy is may, may very well reflect that. Okay. Yes. Um, have you reached out to staff at all to see like what their preference would be, whether if it was beginning of the day or each class or what the school committee could do to kind of support them? Because I think at the end of the day, if the teachers aren't enforcing it or aren't behind it, I don't know how it would be successful. So yeah, we'd so love to kind of like get their feedback on what we can do to make it. There's, there's, so not formally, informally yeah. we've had conversations with different teachers are certainly in favor of a cell phone policy and kids being off of their phones. Um, but there's some hesitation on who's going to enforce this, who's going to collect the phones, right? and, and we, need, we need to figure that out. Yeah. Now the issue is, is there's 400 students and, and two, three administrators in the, if we're talking just the high school, there's two, sometimes three administrators in, they can't collect every phone, right? So we yeah. would absolutely need to figure out a way for teachers to assist with this, but that's exactly why we need to have a, a group of teachers we're talking to, to figure out what is a feasible to happen daily, yeah. right? Daily or every period, right? What, whatever uh, we come to. So that's why this is, this is just a jumping off point. We had started this a little late in the school year, um, and we, we didn't want to bring uh, teachers in over the summer uh, to do this work. But really, one of the push, we had been talking about it, uh, and Mr. Quinty had brought it up, uh, I believe, at a couple of meetings. But the push to bring this to school committee when we did really came from a couple of high school teachers. Yeah. Uh, so I'll be the bad guy, and it's going to be totally rhetorical. So if, even if you want to shut your eyes so you don't make a face, that's absolutely OK. Um, but I think on the flip side, for me as a parent, one of the concerns that I have is some of, and this is I'm going to solely base this on the recent years, um, some of the conduct of the teachers that the students prove through interactions on their phone. And so my concern as a parent is when I'm getting feedback from um, teachers in the presentation and that this is no knock at anybody when I say this, but it has been a benefit at times to see some of the interactions because there seems to be consistency when you review them as in when i say that meaning you're seeing a consistent reaction in a 10 to 15 minute video in october december may you know not just in the context of we all know our kids they can get you at the right time <laughs> and it's not necessarily really what happens but there have been some interactions that i've seen multiple students in different classes or different class times that you're seeing things that then maybe need to be addressed. So I will say from that standpoint, I have some kind of apprehension and I'm only voicing it just to give the voice of some of, you know, the other side and to be completely transparent, right? And that's why I said totally rhetorical, but 
I don't know how as administrators um, that necessarily can be addressed. Kind of, It's kind of up in the air with all the other things, but just even kind of hearing it or thinking about it or reviewing, you know, what does classroom conduct look like on both sides? Um, and I, I can only tolerate kids for 15 minutes, so I can't be a teacher, right? Like, I, I want to appreciate the work that they do, but at the same time, I kind of want to voice that concern because that is one, you know. I, I, I can understand that. Yeah. What I would say is that we have had students come to us with, with concerns and complaints. Yeah. And um, there has been some discipline that has happened in the past two, two to three years, uh, at least since I've been on, um, from student voice. None of those have involved videos of cell phones. Those have involved students making an accusation and us taking it seriously and doing a thorough investigation. Um, so I can understand that, yeah. but I think maybe if you were privy to the information of what has actually been done when a student mm -hmm. brings a concern mm -hmm. um, and how serious we do take it, mm -hmm. I think maybe um, some of your concerns would be, be alleviated. But I can, I can understand yeah. where you're coming from, but when, it, when students come to us, at least uh, I can say when it, when it makes it, its way to uh, administration and certainly to, to our offices, um, we take it serious and we investigate. And uh, you know the the people here have been directly involved in, in uh, many of those. Awesome, and maybe that might be a part of like some of the communication that goes out to the parents. Because I'm sure I'm not the only one, but that's why I said I'll be the bad guy and say it. But that was no reflection on anybody, you know, in the faculty or anything like well, I that. I think part of it might be educating um, our students on what to do, right? If they think what they need to do is 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 take their cell phone mm -hmm. and video rather than come and talk to. Um, the, the principal or assistant principal to get to get assistance with that. That's we need to educate them on when you feel like you or a classmate isn't being treated the right way by an adult in in the school. Who do you talk to first? Right. Yeah. So we can that that can all be part of this. Certainly. That and that's not an angle I've thought about yet though. So thank you for bringing it up. Yeah. Joyce, did you have your hand up? Isn't that part of giving the student? Um, the power to understand that everything is, doesn't go through the cell phone and through technology, but you have to have personal relationships and being able to, and don't we have like student council things where they were having morning groups and stuff like that? The, there is advisory, and that, yeah. that could absolutely be discussed during advisory. Thing. It's really and part of digital citizenship. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, part of this is the kids haven't learned to talk to the person next to them because of the cell phone and because of computer games. But I mean, this is this is part of learning how to deal in your society, no matter what your society is. There's less face-to-face -face interactions. I, mean, I think we've all seen uh, kids or students who are friends sitting next to each other communicating through their phone mm -hmm. when they're this close. Uh, so that's something we have to do a better job of. Chris, do you have anything? I have nothing additional to what's been shared already. Okay, just making sure. Thank you. Anybody else? No? So there's one other part of the superintendent's report. I know this is the first school committee meeting of the year, but we're already asking for a proposed change to the next meeting. The next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, September 18th. There is a conflict. Uh, Laura A. White is having their open house uh, um, the same day as the school committee meeting. So we're hoping that we could move the September 8th meeting to Tuesday, September 17th at the high school. Um, I have a conflict. My, it's only one this year. <laughs> I'm gonna be out of town. Planning on being in it. Trying to be in it. <laughs> I'm good. Right now I'm scheduled to be in Cambridge. Gotcha. So I could dial in, but being here, if it is it six thirty, do you think, or that could be a challenge. Okay. But I could maybe dial in. So they're having their open house on the same day, the eighteenth? September eighteenth. Same day the eighteenth. Mm -hmm. It's fine with me, but I 
-hmm. in person or you know calling in for the first half an hour or something like that certainly may be okay. possible okay. okay so we will uh, make that change thank you and that is all for the superintendent's report are you moving it to tuesday from wednesday is that the from tuesday to wednesday it's from wednesday to tuesday excuse wednesday me to tuesday. Mm -hmm. okay uh, we do not have any ongoing business. Chris, do you have any chairperson's notes? No chairperson's notes. Okay. Other topics for discussion not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance of this meeting? Anyone? Madam yes. Chair, I think something that's very critical that's happening in our area and um, um, not a motion as such, but um, the closing of uh, Neshoba Hospital is critical to our population to our kid population to this area and um, if we could try to draft a letter to the governor um, to get some attention more attention on this I know there's a lot of attention already but it's proceeding at a rapid rate and there is something about it being illegal not giving them 180 days to close and they're giving them about four weeks um, if everybody I don't make a motion. This is all happening so fast. We haven't had a meeting before this mm -hmm. to discuss it. But I think that it behooves us to take um, our public responsibility for our students and our families to uh, protest the closing of the hospital. Okay. I'm yes, sure Adam? I'd be happy to draft that letter um, and send it out to school committee uh, by Friday for approval. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Has to be done. Absolutely. Okay. Communication. All right. Um, Monday, August 26th, and Tuesday, August 27th, all staff reporting to the buildings. Wednesday, August 28th, is the first day of school for grades 1 through 12. Thursday, August 29th, kindergarten orientation. Friday, August 30th, there's no school. Monday, September 2nd, no school and observance of Labor Day. Tuesday, September 3rd is the first day of school for kindergarten. Friday, September 6th, preschool orientation. Monday, September 9th, first day of school for preschool. Thursday, September 12th, middle school open house. Tuesday, September 17th, actually, correction. Oh no, but that is right. <laughs> uh, school committee meeting um, will be rescheduled to that date from Wednesday, 6.30 here at the high school. Wednesday, September 18th is a 90-minute early release day, preschool through 12, professional development for teachers. Wednesday, September 18th is also Laura A. White open house. Wednesday, September 25th, Page Hilltop open house. And Thursday, September 26th is the high school open house. Thank you. Okay, we do not have an executive session, correct? No need. All right, so I will entertain a motion for adjournment. Make a motion we adjourn if I can see the clock right. Let's say 8 o'clock or one minute before, I can't see it. 7.59. That's one minute before. Second. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned.